Welcome students of art history to this quick and dirty version of Renaissance art, part one of our two-part series. So today we're going to talk about Renaissance art, but uh, to really get the full impact of the Renaissance, you got to go to the Louvre. However, the Louvre is rather large and dedicates a lot of time and space to the Renaissance. There's more; It's more than a quarter of a mile long just for the Renaissance wing and over a hundred feet wide. And the fact is that with our class today, ain't nobody got time for that. So we need to move on and do this quick and dirty style and make sure that we're hitting the Renaissance, but uh, just getting a taste for it. So we'll start with Masakio. And Masakio is interesting because he painted for less than six years, but he was highly influential in the early Renaissance period for the intellectual nature of his work, as well as its degree of naturalism. You might also notice, though, that he's doing something interesting here by making sure that the uh, subjects that he's using here for the expulsion of Adam and Eve are nude. There's a few reasons for that. First of all, the Romans. You can see the influence of the Roman arch here. The Romans uh, were big fans of using idealized nude figures. Another one, though, too, is that we're trying to tell the story of Adam and Eve in a form that is didactic, meaning that it teaches us a lesson. And what better way to get a lesson of the downfall of mankind and the sin of mankind than to show the emotion. And you can see that in the torso. If you take a look at the torsos, those are gut-wrenching, literally gut-wrenching tears that they're pouring there. They are not feeling too good. And these are also the first nudes since antiquity, so it's going to be uh, not only realistic, but also going to be a little bit shocking, because people of the time who are looking at this kind of art and the other nude art that's going to come out during the Renaissance are going to be a little bit upset about it. Many critics of the time will claim that this new art is holy eroticism. Yes, it may be religious themed, but it's still erotic to some people. So next here we have a painting by Fra Filippo Lippi giving us the Feast of Herod. And Fra Filippo Lippi is using a cool little tactic called foreshortening. With foreshortening, what he's doing is he's using the horseshoe pattern of the table here in order to give us a feeling of depth, something that the medieval period was unable to accomplish. And another thing that he's using is using foreshortening here on the tiles, making it so that the tiles are larger in the front and smaller in the back, therefore giving us the feeling that it is moving backward and giving us three dimensions. Another cool thing that he's doing here is a narrative style of painting. Because we have different stories that are happening here in the, uh, in, in the single painting. First we have Salome, who is asking for the head of John the Baptist, if you recall that story. Here's Salome doing her dance, the king is totally pleased, Herod is totally pleased, and he says, I will give you whatever you want, and she says, I want the head of John the Baptist, because my saucy mother says that I should have that, the head. And so then the story comes over here to the other side. Now you don't see the different breakup of the story here, but essentially we have two different scenes combined into one, where mom says, hey, give me the head, boom, there's the head. So narrative style, making a flow of the story, pretty cool stuff. Now, next we have a lovely painting here from Pagliolo and the Martyrdom of St. Sebastian. So what's cool about these, this painting is, first of all, it uses dramatic realism. Uh, the uh, poses that, that we're using here give us the sense of, of a very weighty type of subject. We have the death of a saint. And then we also are using counterweights, counterbalances here to give symmetry. So here is the dividing line of the symmetrical uh, aspect of the painting. Over here we have an archer counterweighted him uh, almost to a mirror image, counterweight, counterweight, mirror imaging, counterweight, counterweight, mirror, mirror imaging. All right, and so another thing that's interesting about this is we see some contemporary information because Saint Sebastian, uh, who was martyred, I believe, in the first century sometime, uh, he is certainly not going to be seeing death by crossbow. You see these crossbows here? Those are French crossbows. We also see some French knights in the background. Uh, that is, you know, something that he's using there to make it a little bit more realistic to the, his modern viewers, but then again, also the issue of symmetry and counterweights. So there's Paliulu. Now, next, we get a saucy picture here from Botticelli, Sandro Botticelli, giving us Venus and Mars. Now with Venus and Mars, there's some interesting things that he's doing. First of all, we have the idea of Roman mythology coming back. So we get some mythology emphasized here, which shows a greater emphasis on Greco-Roman culture. We also see that uh, Mars, the god of war, is being conquered by the goddess of love. And the fawns are taking away all of his weapons now that he has been conquered, so to speak. So there is Venus, the goddess of love. There is Mars, the uh, god of war who can only be conquered 
quote unquote, from um, from the perspective of love. And so uh, you notice that Mars, he is definitely half naked there, almost, well, more than half naked, whereas Venus is not. She is not in an erotic pose. Instead, she remains alert, which symbolizes the permanence of peace that is needed. But in order to maintain that, you got to stay alert. You got to stay away from the draws of war. And then we also have a nerd word of the day for you here. Neoplatonism was a big philosophical idea of the time in which it stressed the uh, the morality of classical antiquity, but then combined that with Christianity. Because believe it or not, there were some moral individuals back in the ancient days, even though they may not have been Christian, and so they're emphasizing both now. Uh, so classical ph philosophy is meeting Christianity in Botticelli. All right, we get some more Roman mythology here with the birth of Venus by Sandro Botticelli. And so a beautiful painting here uh, that was uh, that's going to emphasize harmony of movement. There's... Uh, indifference to detail if you look back here at the background indifference to detail because the emphasis is instead on the idealized figures of Venus and these fun little nymphs that are around here the Medici family patronized this painting and then had it put above the bed in the uh, bedroom of a newly married couple in the Medici family and so it was meant not to be erotic for the two of them but instead uh, shall we say, inspirational. Mm -hmm. All right, next we've got a lovely little painting here from Perugino, giving us Christ giving the keys to St. Peter. So, of course, the story is that Christ gave the keys to heaven to St. Peter. Those were not literal, by the way. Uh, so he symbolically gave him the keys to heaven. And so this is an emphasis on uh, on the history of the Catholic Church here, being that, that Peter is the establishment of the Pope's rule in the church. But we also see not only a classical story here from the Bible, but we also see a lot of Renaissance stuff happening here. So first of all, some cool Renaissance things. This is perspective painting because we have the use of vanishing points. So the vanishing point starts here at the key, but then your eyes are drawn back to the actual little building back there. It's glorious. All right, and then we also see a lot of Greco-Roman influence with the arching that's happening there. And you might also notice that these dudes right here are not wearing the biblical clothing of the disciples or Jesus. Instead, we have all of these Renaissance-attired men. We have Renaissance-attired people back here as well, and we see symmetry as well, uh, counterbalancing this side with this side. So next, we have some very secular kind of painting here, an individual portrait, which is something you would never have seen during the Dark Ages. So Giovanni Bellini giving us portrait of Doge Leonardo Loredan. Now the Doge was the leader of Venice at this time, and so we have a Venetian Doge here that is giving us uh, a little bit of um, glory to himself. Yeah, this is very much uh, indicative of the Renaissance emphasis on individualism and also upon secularism. You don't see a whole lot of um, uh, religious influence here, although you could argue that these goofy looking things kind of look like garlic balls. Maybe he's protecting himself from a vampire. He looks a little vampiric himself. I don't know. I wouldn't put it past him. But there you go. There's a little bit of individualism in self-portraiture. Now this painting by Jan van Eck is indicative of a lot of different cool things. First of all, we see uh, in this painting the Arlofini marriage. Jan van Eck is combining medieval ideas about marriage with medieval culture along with the new developing ideas in the Renaissance. And so some different things happening here. First of all, this is part of the Northern Renaissance, which I indicated. It also gives us lots of different religious symbolism. All right, so first of all, the Arlofinis are a newlywed couple, but one thing you might notice is we got a bun in the oven. That is because in the medieval period, most of the time, men and women would try to consummate before marriage because they wanted to make sure that, you know, the things were working. Got to make sure the parts are all aligned in there because you do not want to get married if you cannot have babies, all right? And so Mr. Arlofini is also wearing a fur, which in the both the Renaissance and medieval periods was indicative of wealth. However, he's newly wealthy. He was not born into his wealth. We can tell by his hat because he is a merchant, all right, if he was born into his wealth, he'd be kicking it in a castle. Nope, he is a merchant, and so he is also an Arlofini, so he's Italian, but this painting was done in uh, the Northern Renaissance. He was a merchant in Flanders at this time, and so he is a famous man up there. All right, another thing that we see here, we see the uh, ties of, of trade that's happening here with these shoes are from the Italian peninsula. Here we have a dog, which is indicative of loyalty. Here we have a single lit candle, which was something that, um, what, when 
marriages were first being consummated on the night of their wedding, they would make sure to light a single candle, which was a call out to St. Lucia uh, in order to give them divine inspiration and also some divine babies, hopefully, in the mix. You would also have some oranges here because that was something that you would always eat right before making love to your wife so that you could make sure you had a child in the mix there. Another thing, too, if you zoom in on this scene right here, uh, this convex mirror that's being used here, around the mirror you see the different stages of the crucifixion of Christ, so very much religious and medieval in its symbolism, but then if you look in the mirror right here, you can see that it is a reflection of what's happening in this scene. Here's Mr. Arlofini's back, here's Mrs. Arlofini, and there is Jan van Eck right there in the middle if you look really close. And then it right here says a signature, which you would not do in the medieval period. Here is a signature saying Jan van Eck was here. So we see the combination of medieval and Renaissance art happening. Now here is definitely a painting that gives us uh, Renaissance tactics, but definitely medieval ideas. This one is by Grunwald, giving us the temptation of Saint Anthony. And so with this one, we see some vivid and terrifying things happening here, where the monsters of sin are being used to frighten him out of his faith. So Saint Anthony apparently went through a lot of uh, a lot of troubles in his faith in which he fought against demons. Look at this guy, for instance, this morphodidic demon popping out his cystic acne off of his belly and these weird birds and this guy is just gnawing on something. He's pissed, all right? So all of the, the sins that were tempting Saint Anthony as they're pulling at him here, he is trying to resist them no matter what kinds of things are coming at him. A little bit of didactic material for you there as well. And now here we see another glorious Northern Renaissance painting by Hieronymus Bosch, a, uh, a Dutch painter who is terrified of the possibilities of hell and sin and temptation. Hieronymus Bosch here is giving us Christ carrying the cross. As you can see, Christ not having a good day there as he carries the cross, but then surrounded by him are these terrifyingly ugly figures. Because the way that Hieronymus Bosch did things is any time that he wanted to reveal someone's inner darkness or their sin. He would simply make them look like so. All right, but we also can see some contemporary issues here. We see a, a man that appears to be wearing a merchant's hat, which would have been contemporary of Bosch's time. Maybe he was pointing at someone specific. We also see a monk a, who appears to be a crazed monk. I mean, you notice the monkish haircut there. All right, so that is uh, revealing not only the time period um, of Christ, but also particularly here for uh, Bosch's time period as well. You can also see Veronica here, the one figure that doesn't have a scary looking face next to Christ um, because she was a good woman, a saint, and has even a lovely little uh, picture of Christ now on her towel that she used to wipe him with. So that's the end of our Renaissance art for today. Be sure to check out part two of our Renaissance Quick and Dirty Art series.